It seems remarkable now that anyone would be so excited about getting the vote that they would dedicate their whole lives to securing it. Because most modern politicians, I think you'll agree, like yourself, seem to be the embodiment of passionless, soulless, dullness. Do you agree with that? Sorry, can we start then? What, what are we talking about? But most young people have so little interest in elections that they don't even know how they work. I know this from when I stood in an election and I was giving out these leaflets and these two students came up and one went, yes, yeah, safe, man, yeah, oh, I'm going to vote for you, man. And his mate went, well, you can't vote, man, you're only 17. And he said, yeah, I can get round out, I've got connections, man. So maybe things were different back in the days of the suffragettes. Or maybe the suffragettes were about much more than the vote. <laughs> Sylvia Pankhurst became a hero to thousands of the poorest people in the East End of London. She was attacked by Lenin for being too left-wing, and she ended up living in Ethiopia, revered as a princess under King of the Rastafarians, Haile Selassie. Sylvia Pankhurst was born in Manchester in 1882, at a time when, to most people in authority, the idea of women voting was heresy. For example, the MP for Hereford, C.W. Radcliffe Hook, said, I will oppose the right of women to vote until women are bigger than men. Which is fantastic logic. So what about big women then? Can they have the vote? And what about things that are bigger than men? Do they get the vote? The Tory MP for Colchester, E.K. Carslake, said, The wife should be absolutely and entirely under the control of her husband. She may not gad about, and if she does, her husband is entitled to lock her up. Manchester was the most radical city in England at the time, and two of the most prominent characters in these circles in the 1870s were Emmeline and Dr Richard Pankhurst, who supported causes such as the abolition of the workhouse and votes for women. The Pankhursts had five children, including Harry, who died young. Then there was Christabel and Sylvia, now, despite her liberal parents, Sylvia remembered... Under the discipline of the servants, being tied to the bed all day for refusing to take cod liver oil. Only the Victorians could decide the punishment for not taking something to ease your joints is to strap your joints to furniture. During Sylvia's childhood, the radical movement was transformed by a mass agitation for better working conditions by some of the poorest people in the country, including women matchmakers in this building in East London who went on strike. The women were especially annoyed because they'd had their wages docked, partly to pay for a statue to ex-Prime Minister Gladstone. The strike had a huge impact in raising the status of working class women in the community. Now the factory has been turned into loft style apartments. But the developers have made a special effort to preserve the history by making sure that each flat is roughly the size of a matchbox. The strikes changed the outlook of the Pankhurst family and they became involved in the newly formed Independent Labour Party. And it's important to remember that at that time people joined that party in order to make it a radical campaigning organisation. Whereas if anyone tried to do that with the modern Labour Party they might as well join the RAC and try to turn it into a radical campaigning breakdown service. There was another effect of the Independent Labour Party on Sylvia Pankhurst. The leader of the new organisation was Keir Hardy, who was a passionate supporter of votes for women. Hardy had been brought up in Lanarkshire, where he had to sleep on a dirt floor and started working in the pit at the age of ten, until one morning when he turned up late because he was looking after his dying brother and he was sacked. Bastards! Keir Hardy became the first independent Labour Party MP for the area of West Ham, and one day when Sylvia came home from school, she found Keir Hardy in the living room talking to her parents. And later on she wrote about this meeting. His eyes were two deep wells of kindness, like mountain pools with the sunlight distilled. I felt I could have rushed into his arms. For several years she spent any time she could with Keir Hardy. She'd help him write his speeches and in turn he'd read her the works of Shelley, Byron and William Morris. All this would have been scandalous for any unmarried couple at the time, but Sylvia was 21 and Hardy was nearly 50 and married. Mm -hmm. With Sylvia, he could let down for a moment the granite image of the working class fighter and indulge his artistic side, while she was attracted to the radicalism of a man that was untainted by the peculiarities of a middle class upbringing. Writing about one of their days out together, she said... He would pick up little stones and play with them as children do. You know, I never played games as a child, I said. Ah, he said with infinite compassion and tenderness, that is the matter with you. You heard too much serious talk. Sorry. 
But in 1900, the campaign for votes for women came together with the working class movement in the Lancashire cotton mills when the weavers launched their petition for the vote. And then a group of people met in this room in the Pankhurst House to decide what to do next. And that's when the Women's Social and Political Union was formed. They decided to start off with some high profile stunts. Good morning. For example, she took a petition and went banging on the Prime Minister's door. Hello. At which point she was arrested. And stunts like this attracted national coverage until the Daily Mail called the women suffragettes, so they adopted that as their official title. Yes, yes, soldiers in petty coats and, and Emmeline in particular became known as an impressive speaker, especially in the poor areas. In 1907 there were 400 meetings in which there were over a thousand people, and the marches also got bigger until after one march in Hyde Park, the Times reported, it is no exaggeration to say that the number of people present was the largest ever gathered together on one spot at one time in the history of the world. The Pankhurst's next tactic was to rush the House of Commons, so Emmeline and Christabel were jailed. The protest did eventually take place, but an inspector informed the women that the Prime Minister wouldn't see them, so Emmeline punched him in the jaw and they got arrested for assault. They should have had somebody doing an advert going, I can throw stones and break windows but could I punch a copper square on the jaw and get arrested? I don't know if I could do that. If you could join the suffragettes. In the fighting that followed these arrests, 108 more women were arrested. So that night, a group of suffragettes came to the Home Office with stones wrapped in brown paper and smashed all the windows. From that moment onwards, Emmeline and Christabel were committed to a strategy of smashing things. And the theoretical basis behind this plan was summed up by the elderly suffragette who said,